come on up here and enlighten us on what he does with yoga. Thanks so much, Jason, and uh, thanks all for, for coming back. Three days of sitting here. So, uh, so you can see we're going to talk about uh, yoga therapy as a vehicle for uh, providing pain science education. Um, this is the outline that we've got. Is I just want to tell you a little bit more about, the, about yoga, because I'm guessing that some of you don't know a lot about it. I um, also want to tell you a little bit about the research around this. So one of the things I'm really happy that I get to do is, is uh, um, I'm going to explain to you that there's actually level one evidence in support of using yoga for people with chronic pain. I'm also going to tell you about the gaps around that evidence, but uh, it's sort of neat to work in a world where I get to uh, integrate two different things that have level one evidence. So we have pain science education and yoga for people in pain both have that, which I'll try to explain a little bit more. Um, and I want to talk about how we can integrate these two things together. But I want to make sure you understand is that um, I'm not just a yoga guy, I'm a clinician, I'm an academic. Um, so yoga is, is a vehicle that I think that we could use to try to integrate um, what we're doing around pain neuroscience education with our patients. And I think really the idea here is um, how do we get beyond just talking to our patients? Um, you know, you think about cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, I think we are the cognitive behavioral therapists because we get to actually do things with people's bodies to change their physical behavior. And that's what I think makes these things stick a lot. Um, oftentimes, I think what we do is we treat our patients like we think our patients learn like we do. We learn this way fairly well. And a lot of our patients don't learn this way very well. They learn through kinesthetic learning. And yoga is an opportunity for us to do that. It's also interesting listening to the speakers from the last few days. It's like we're saying the same thing, right? We're using different language around it. And I think that's sort of cool is that we're all, we're all saying very, very similar things, but we don't have a common language yet, right? And that'll be sort of fascinating to see how that works as we go along. Um, so lots of people are using yoga. Uh, the, this is a, a, a recent look at, in the United States, 20 million or more people practice yoga every week. I know the Yoga Journal, if you read Yoga Journal a few years ago, they actually said that 65 million people were doing yoga every week, uh, but we just found out that that really wasn't all that accurate. They sort of overestimated things, as you can expect they might do. But anyway, so a lot of people are actually using yoga for exercise, and people are starting to come to yoga as a complementary medicine. Um, well, some people are using it as an alternative medicine, right? They're saying, I don't want that other stuff, we'll go over here. Um, and I, I think we really need to figure out how to integrate this, this in. Um, we even have the American Pain Society and the American Medical Association recommending yoga for people who have low back pain. So there's a recommendation that was from CHU, I think it was 2008, came out. So there's this, this move to try to integrate this. So we need to understand a little bit better. So I just want to make sure you understand a little bit better. So yoga affects the body, which is what most people see yoga as, is something that's there to do something about your body, to, to line you up, to make you stronger, to make you more flexible. Uh, but yoga also works on the mind. So it has a lot to do with uh, introspection and interoception, and it teaches about concentration and, and mindfulness. Um, and then also has to do with your spirit, which is a word that we all sort of hesitate around using. What exactly is this thing? But you can think of it as the purpose, the, the meaning of life to you. Right? It doesn't have to be about a religious, spiritual uh, practice. It really has to do with more of these things, calm and peace. And as you've heard from some of the pre presenters, finding a sense of calmness and peace, peacefulness is often a really great way to move therapy forward that a lot of our, our action-oriented patients aren't there yet. Right? They're just trying to crank up the fight-flight system, actually the fight system all the time. And sometimes finding this is where they need to go. So if you don't know, yoga, they say, was three to 4,000 years ago. Uh, so it, it's before we were writing things down. It was, a, it was an oral tradition passed down over the time. Um, and then about 1,000 years ago, this, this Hatha yoga came up, um, which was more focused away from the meditation and the spiritual aspect of it onto the physical body. And now, it's interesting, the physical body at this time, that what they thought was that the physical body was actually just the, the torso. So as far as we understand, the idea was you started to do the movements of yoga to keep your body healthy. 
But it wasn't about, like, you know, the yoga that we see now isn't so much to do with your torso anymore. It's very much, it's about your legs and it's about your arms and, and balancing on, on these things and twisting yourself around is often the way we see it. Um, but now we have all these, these postures, right? The, the Western yoga has really changed from the yoga that was there before, where now it's a focus on, on what you do with your body. So much so that most people come to yoga thinking it's all about becoming more flexible, right? Uh, one of the yoga guys in, uh, well, he's from Canada, but he's now down in Santa Cruz. His name is Ian Finn. Um, and I like one of the things he says. He says that uh, um, saying that you're not flexible enough to do yoga is like saying you're too dirty to take a shower. <laughs> and the thing is about yoga is it allows us to be more flexible in every aspect of our existence not just to be uh, flexible with our physical self, right? It's really looking at that broader flexibility. So yoga has a bunch of aspects to it. So it has an aspect of looking at how we act in the world and how we treat ourselves. And these are the, the, the Sanskrit words, the yamas and the yamas, which if, you, if you've never read about these, I'm not going to get deep into them, but they actually sound a whole lot like the Ten Commandments. So the things like moderation and kindness and, and uh, not coveting, so it's very, very similar to these things. But yoga has these. And a lot of people don't know that yoga is about this. It's about how you're acting with yourself. Most people know that yoga has breathing and it has postures, right? That yoga has this stuff, pranayama. Prana is about energy. Uh, but we can also consider it a bit about breathing. So yoga has these, which most of us know about. A lot of us don't know that yoga has to do with this other term. It's pradyahara is the yogic term about it. But this is really about interoception. This is about actually taking your awareness from outside to inside, right? And it was interesting. I, I loved what Eric was talking about is, is that uncertainty, you know, how do we find a way not to be uncertain? Well, sometimes the way to get past uncertainty about pain is to take your awareness inside, actually to spend time paying attention to your physical self and paying attention to your thoughts and paying attention to your emotions and paying attention to your breath. These are all things that are part of, of yoga. And we've got some evidence to support those. Yoga also has these two things. It has concentration and meditation. Right? So the idea is let's get you to teach you to focus on what you want to be able to focus on. And I'm sure most of you recognize that in the face of pain, what does your brain get you to focus on? The pain. Right? And sometimes what we need to do is teach our brain to pay attention to what we want to pay attention to as well in the end. And so yoga has these aspects in it as well. And then it's got this sort of elusive last part of it uh, called samadhi, uh, which in yoga is usually translated as enlightenment. And I've just given you a different look at it here. It's just when you figure stuff out, right? When you, you find out who you are and your purpose in the world, that sort of thing. Um, of course, a lot of us never get there anyway. But it's, it's part, of, part of yoga. So this is another important part. So I've said this is what yo the most of the yoga is about, but yoga produces pain. We actually know that people come to yoga and they get injured, right? We know that when people have pain, it hurts to move, right? So this, this is a bit of a contrary thing, right? Is if you're going to recommend yoga to somebody, well, the person has come into you and said, hey, you know, it hurts when I move. And, well, let's do yoga. I'm guessing that a lot of your patients would go, what are you talking about? I mean, that doesn't really seem to make sense. I just told you that it hurts. Aren't you listening to me, right? Have you ever thought about that? Just forget about the yoga for a sec. Your patient comes in and they tell you it hurts and it hurts to move and they want to know what the solution is and nearly all the times we tell them that they should move. And so you get the patient in front of you going, I'm not really sure you really heard me, right? Because I just told you it hurts and you're telling me that to move even though it hurts. And it's a question that a lot of people have is, you're telling me that I should move but you're not telling me how to do it, right? And I love what Corey said and I'm going to talk a little bit more, very, it's going to sound really similar. Actually, a few people after the yoga class this morning, they came up to me and said, oh, I loved how you worked Corey's edge work into what you do. And I'm like, that's really cool because I don't think Corey and I have ever talked about it, right? But as you'll see, that the, the idea that I've got is so darn similar, it's extraordinary. Uh, well, maybe we're just both demented in our thinking. It's hard to say, right? Anyway, um, so we need to keep this in mind all the time, is that even though there may be evidence around yoga helping, it also could cause people injury if they're not, just like any movement practice could. So I wanted to quickly tell you about some of the research, yoga research, but not get into there too much. There are four meta-analysis in the last few years that have been done 
This is one of the, their, uh, their Busing group. So there's evidence that yoga may be useful for several pain-associated disorders. They looked at all of these ones. So these aren't just musculoskeletal pain. These are irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia. They're looking at the um, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, the, the more disease process pains as well. So this is what they came up with. And then this other group, Ward et al. in 2013, came up with that in clinically significant improvement in functional, functional outcomes in mild to moderate low back pain and fibromyalgia. Right? And then they get significant improvements in pain with OA. So this is pain this time. In OA, RA, and mild to severe low back pain. And then significant improved psychological outcomes in mild to moderate low back pain in OA. That's pretty good, right? So we're, they're seeing that yoga is changing pain. The research, the meta-analysis says it's changing function and it's changing psychological outcomes, the, the different aspects that we want to try to, to change. So Ward also said this, that there's evidence that yoga is an acceptable and safe intervention. Now, part of the reason they said that was because they couldn't find a lot of reports of people being injured in yoga, which may just be that they've never been reported. Right? There hasn't been a lot, of, a lot of people actually looking at how many uh, people who have pain and go to yoga actually get worse to do it. That's not been reported well yet. But they also said um, that it may uh, result in clinically relevant improvements in pain and functional outcomes in a lot of the MSK problems, a lot of the musculoskeletal pain conditions, which again is pretty positive stuff. But one of the questions they had is this word down here, it says dosage. And they're really asking what is the dose that works for this because most of the research is sort of all over the map with this. Although a lot of the research looks at two classes a week, typically telling people to go home and practice maybe 30 to 40 minutes, four days a week on top of that. Um, and some of the re research studies, unfortunately, is one of the gaps, is some of the research studies didn't look at did people actually complete it. One of the research studies that looked at did people actually go to those two classes and do the four days at, we at home I actually found that the average person did one class a week, two days at home, instead of doing the 40 minutes, I think they did around 16 minutes. And what was really amazing about that research study is it still showed better benefits than the, uh, the non-treatment. So this, this, was, this was a control group where people weren't doing an exercise routine, right? So compared to nothing, it was better to do something, right, was really what they were showing. So Kramer did another one. So Kramer's looking at low back pain. This is just chronic low back pain, which is the other ones we're looking at more problems. So they found strong evidence for short-term effectiveness and moderate evidence for long-term effectiveness of yoga for chronic low back pain. Have you ever read any other meta-analysis that said that around an exercise routine? I can guarantee you heavens, right? Because none of them show the moderate evidence. Now, we may say that there's some bias here because some of the authors of this do have some interest in it, but yet they've, they've had this formula around uh, meta-analysis and they've come up with this moderate um, evidence. A lot of the other research says there's no evidence or there's not much evidence. So this, this, is, this is pretty good. So the research gaps to tell you about this is uh, one of the things that we really need to look at is expectation of success. And some of the researchers around yoga have started to look at this. So if you provide a person with yoga compared to another treatment pr process, if they believe yoga is going to be more effective than the other intervention, you need to know that. Right? You need to know because maybe the reason they got so much better is because they believe it was going to make them better compared to the other one. And so some of the research is starting to look at this, but a lot of the research has not looked at this yet. And this is really powerful. We know, we know how important it is to look at. In the original, the, the first meta-analysis that was done on yoga for chronic low back pain, the vast majority of the research studies that they, that they um, reported on, if you were to look at who are the people in the study, the typical person in their study was a 42-year-old white woman, gainfully employed, university educated, making more than $60,000 a year. So I'm guessing that most of us in here, this is not the people that we treat. Right? This might be the yoga world in Malibu, <laughs> right? but it may not be representative. And this is the key we need to think of. It may not be representative of all people, but it might be. You don't know one way or the other, but you have to look at it and say, it's like, is this really a representation? Um, there is one study, and only one, that was really, really well done where they took first-generation immigrants to the United States in Chicago 
who were on workers' compensation, very low social economic status, with no expectation that yoga would be of any assistance to them whatsoever. And they did improve with it. So it says that maybe it's not just about that particular social economic status or, or group. But we got to watch for this, right? The styles of yoga. Typically, the styles of yoga in this research are Iyengar, Yin yoga. Um, some they just call it Hatha yoga. So if you start reading this research, you sort of look at, well, what exactly is it that they're doing in there? And the really interesting thing is I showed you those eight different things that are part of yoga. Most of the research studies, what they report to you is that they gave them these postures. These are the postures we gave the person for this problem. And this is the one breathing technique we gave them for that problem. Well, that's not yoga, right? It's an aspect of yoga. It's almost like a reductionist look at yoga so we can actually control it some. And of course, you know, the yoga people that I know would say, well, hmm, if we only give them postures and breathing and they did that well, I wonder what would happen if we gave them more. You see there's a bit of a logical problem there, right? Just you don't know. Maybe if you give them more, it messes the whole thing up and it's not useful anymore. We don't know that, right? We have this idea that more would be better, but it's not necessarily true. And we don't have the research that's gone there yet. Now, I'm hoping you get the idea that, you know, I think yoga could be good, but I just want to make sure you all understand that there's gaps around this research. Um, we don't know the dose. We don't know how many minutes you need to do this every day, just like for nearly everything else that we do. We do not know how many minutes... How many days? If you're thinking about neuroplasticity and changing the nervous system, you're usually thinking about doing something where you change the nervous system repeatedly, right? It's like if you want to get better at throwing darts, you probably need to practice it more than five minutes once a week and expect that you'll be better next week. Right? Same with, with any, most of the things, we, I was going to say any, but most of the things that we do around changing the nervous system, you need to do it and do it and do it and do it and then just look for change to actually persist which, by the way, is one of the reasons why yoga can be good, but any other exercise routine can be good, right? Something that the person can do, where we've taught them about pain neuroscience, and we've taught them about, about what they need to do to get better, and then we provide them with a low-cost opportunity to practice the same thing over and over and over again, would be a really good idea, right? Because I, I, from what I hear, definitely with the, the U.S. system, People are not staying with you very long, right? They're, they're off into the community, so we need some sort of community system, which would help. So we also don't know this. We don't know the interactions with medication use. We don't know about people returning to work. Some of the really key, key outcomes that we often look for is, can you take people with low back pain and actually decrease their medication use to a place where they're less dopey or, or having less side effects? Can you use yoga to help people to get back to work? We don't know these things yet. Um, so we don't want to jump to those conclusions. And I mention this because a lot of the studies that report about yoga, they get to the end and it sounds like it's a panacea. Right? It looks like they've, they've said, here's what the research says, but their conclusion statement makes it sound like it fixes everything which of course makes everybody say, well, it's just baloney. Then if you're, if you're saying it fixes everything, then you're probably not right. So this is just a bunch of other yoga research findings, right? There's been findings that it, it changes all these different things, right? Um, recently, there was a study actually just a few weeks ago that came out that looked at if people practice yoga more than 10 years and the people who are doing it were using yoga for much more of a broader perspective than just for exercise, would it change their pain detection? Would it change their pain tolerance? And was there any difference in the way that their brain, seemed, their brain reacted when they were feeling uh, thermal pain on their skin? And what they found was that um, there wasn't any difference in pain detection. So whether you did yoga or you didn't do yoga, you detected pain at about the same level of thermal input. Uh, what they did find is that the people who are practicing yoga over 10 years consistently, if you got them to stick their hand in a bucket of ice water, the cold presser test, they kept their hand in the bucket of ice water about twice as long, and that they had a whole bunch of different strategies that they used to be able to deal with the fact that, that it's a noxious event. And when they looked at the brain, they saw that the insula was different. They actually saw, with the research, it's one of these things I need to look in more deeply because I don't understand the, the fMRI research well enough, but they reported that the insula was thicker, the gray matter of the insula was thicker, and that they, there was greater connectivity shown in the white matter of the insula, which was 
sort of a fascinating thing. So, and it's one of the things in yoga we would say is that it makes you more aware, it makes you more connected to things. So we have to look at that one a little bit more deeply and see what, it's, what it says. Because we know from the mindfulness area, the meditation area, that if you meditate for a long time, your, your insula, which has to do with lots of stuff, but one of the things it has to do with is your ability to be able to feel your physiological state is actually thicker when people meditate longer. Right? We used to wonder, is the, is the insula thicker, and is that why people meditate? You know, like, does that make some sense? You know, are the people with dan the people who are dancers, are they dancers because they had this to start with? Well, there's yes. And so they were wondering is the people who, who gravitated to meditation was that their brain was just set up to make it easier for them to do it to start with. And what they've shown is that, that as you meditate longer, these parts of the brain actually do change. And it seems like yoga has a similar effect. But remember, it's brain scan stuff, right? Uh, there's recently a, a study where they're looking at the way scientists report the amygdala versus the hippocampus, you know, those two cool areas of the brain. And what these researchers were saying is that maybe we need to go back and look at all that research because the architecture of the brain is so different between individuals that where we thought the amygdala was and where we thought the hippocampus is are so different between people that a lot of our research may have actually been pretty skewed around the fMRI work. It's a little bit like the dead salmon in the functional MRI. You know that? These guys in Seattle, they're doing the, the fMRI research, and they decide one guy buys a salmon, he's going to cook it up that night, brings it back, and he puts it in the functional MRI machine, and he shows the salmon pictures of, of f human facial expressions. And they look, they, they do the functional MRI of the, of the salmon's brain. And on a few of the trials, the, the salmon actually showed brain activity on the functional MRI. The dead salmon showed brain activity when you showed it pictures. So what these guys were saying is that, you know, we need, to, we need to be careful. Really, the point is we need to be careful about fMRI research, not thinking it's, right? Yeah. It was a couple years ago, so I can't tell you for sure whether fMRIs have gotten better since then, but that's what these guys were saying. Anyway, so on we go. Pain neuroscience education, I don't need to tell you a whole lot about this, but I want to give you a bit of a different view uh, or it might not be different from what you already think. I'm hoping you all agree with this. The point of this is to try to change pain beliefs and attitudes to create a new perspective on pain, to reconceptualize it, right? Um, and to perceive pain and therefore painful movement as less dangerous. Would you all sort of buy that? That's what we're trying to do around this? I mean, it may not be all the things we're trying to do, but this is part of it, all right? Um, I think what we're also trying to do with this education is to provide the brain with an experience that's inconsistent with its current conclusion. If you have pain, your brain has decided that what's going on right now is dangerous. And one of the things that this education does is it provides the brain with a message that's inconsistent with the brain's interpretation. Does that sort of make sense? Now I think what we want to do is say, well, maybe we can do the same thing with yoga. Maybe the practice of yoga or the practice of many of the things that we do, maybe all of the things that we do in physiotherapy partly has to do with providing the brain with an experience that's inconsistent with the brain's decision about how threatening this really is. I think it's a key thing that we need to, to consider if you haven't considered before. So the key messages that we try to give within this is that pain's related to both the nervous system, nervous systems, and your tissues, right? So we could say, well, maybe the tissues did get all better but we don't always know that for sure. But we're trying to give this message that your nervous system is involved with this, right? We're also trying to give the, the people the message of hope that we've talked about, that the nervous system is something that can be changed. Like, heck, the nervous system is changing right now, right? So let's take advantage of the fact that this is a very adaptable, it's always changing system. And I think what we can do with yoga, or yoga would say, is that like the first comment here, is that pain is not only related to your physical self. The pain, your, your existence is much more complicated than just the physical you. Right? So in yoga, we, you, know, we, you say we have the body, you have the mind, the spirit. Well, actually, in yoga, we have a, a broader philosophy than that even. So the second thing, we have this idea of the nervous system can be changed. Well, um, yoga would say, the philosophy of yoga would say is you can change any aspect of your existence through any other aspect of your existence. That you could use your body to change your mind. You could do something spiritual to actually change your body. 
You can use your mind to change your body, right? That you can cross these, these uh, uh, aspects of yourself. When we provide pain or science education, we usually are using metaphors. We're using sometimes diagrams when we're giving people the education. And the whole point of this is try to give them the education, but provide it in different ways. Have you ever seen somebody do pain neuroscience education without story? There's actually a, a, a pain management center in Canada, and they've got a, um, they do pain neuroscience education on video. And if you watch the video, the person stands behind a podium the whole time and looks down and reads what's down there. Never gives a story, provides all of the key components of pain neuroscience education without engaging the people in front of them, without giving story, right? And it's absolutely different. <laughs> it's not effective, right? I've actually had people go to that, because I facilitated at that, at that center and gave their patients this and you know, I had the people saying, well, that was different because you know, I've, I've heard all that before, but I didn't get it. And it was because the story wasn't there. The metaphors weren't there, right? which I'm guessing that you all, you all recognize that. So in yoga, what we can do is provide this introspective experience. right? So what we're trying to do is not just get people to breathe and move. We're trying to give an experience where the person actually looks at how do I interact with my pain? How do I approach pain in terms of movement? Um, it allows people to work on paying attention to their breath and their body tension and their thoughts, their emotions. All these things that you've heard everyone saying are really, really important to do. Right? Um, so these are like all the different aspects of it. And I think this is one of the reasons why yoga can be a vehicle to use pain neuroscience education, because it's doing very similar things, or you can use it to do very different or similar things. So pain neuroscience education provides an explanatory model consistent with a biopsychosocial perspective on pain, right? So pain neuroscience, ex, uh, uh, pain neuroscience education also provides an explanatory model that's consistent with a yoga philosophy, right? These things fit together in a really, really quite great way. Because here we're saying is that it, there's hope. This is changeable. We need to actually work on trying to change your nervous system to give you the opportunity to change it. Or if we go back to the inconsistent thing, is if I could get you to move in a way that was less painful, whether it was with yoga or anything else, that would be inconsistent with your brain's interpretation of threat. If I could then give you the opportunity to practice this over and over and over again, then it has more chance for the nervous system to change on top of that, right? That's one of the things that and you can do it in yoga and you can do it in other, other uh, movement practices as well. You've all seen this about a gazillion times, so we don't really have to talk about this a whole lot anymore, right? But I think what we can do is we can say everything that's over there on the left side of the screen, you could use yoga as a way to change any of those inputs or any and all of those inputs. Right? And if you're going to be able to change those inputs, of course, you can change any of the outputs that are here. It would be really nice if we could make this model more representative of the reality that they're showing. right? But unfortunately, as everyone's told you already, if this model actually showed you the way it really works, is that every one of those outputs would immediately become an input. And so it would be quite a mess. Right? And any of the inputs can actually interact with each other on the way in. And it's a moving target, too. That's another big big trouble with this when we look at this. This is a two-dimensional model of a human experience, which is wildly more complex, right? You know, we've seen the definition of pain a bunch of times. Maybe you've seen that up here, the ISP. Um, I like to think of pain as a complex, troublesome human emotion, a whole lot like love. <laughs> and I think if one of the things that we've really had the advantage of over this weekend is what we've been doing is we've been spending time thinking about what we think about pain. And it's actually one of the key things that I think that, that we need to do is spend more time thinking about what we think about it. And when we do that, we start to recognize that, well, yeah, you can see pain as a symptom, and you can see pain as, as the IASP's definition. You can see it as a sensation and as an emotion and as invisible and everything. And when you start to see pain in all these different aspects, I think that helps us understand it a lot better right, than just the, the constrained views that we typically have. So yoga philosophy is an integrated model of the human organism. 
and the human organism is seen as an integration of systems, right? So there is that the body, mind, spirit are integrated. It's really troublesome because we don't have a word, right? Because if we talk about yoga, we often talk about the body and the mind and the spirit, but the yoga talk isn't that these things are three separate things. They're one thing inside, the very, in, inside you. They're all integrated there. They're not different. And they have a model within yoga that's, that's called the Panchamaya model, which is pretty similar to the biopsychosocial, but instead of those three, it gives us three, five. So it says you've got the physical body, which is, they call it the Anamaya Kosha, and then the, the, the yogis believe there was the energetic you, which we're still sort of, you know, how do we, how do we measure that? What really is that? Um, then the yogi said there's the lower mind, which you could think of as more like Diane was saying, but it's the critter brain, right? It's the autonomic stuff, the more automatic things that are going on. And then you've got the higher mind, which is more the, the you thinking, right? You get the idea that it's all you, but there's, it's like there's these different, different aspects of us that can do these things. And then they have the last one is eternal consciousness, and I don't know how to talk about that a whole lot, um, but it's, it's this, this other sort of higher aspect of ourselves. And the yogi, yogis would say, even though we got five of these down, they're all still inside there, right? Unfortunately, the yoga model of this nearly always shows a person sitting, you know, of course, in lotus, <laughs> and the, the, the physical body, the Anamaya Kosha arrow goes into the person, and then there's another layer around them, and the pranamaya kosha goes into that layer, and then there's another layer, and another layer, and another layer, which unfortunately gives you the idea that these are separate. But of course, we know that they're not, and I think that's what pain neuroscience education tells us too, is that these aren't separate, right? Is that we've got to consider that when we're working with people, we're not just trying to change their cognitions, we're trying to change the automa automatic nervous system, we're trying to change that critter brain, we're trying to change the person's body as well. We're trying to change all the aspects of them to try to get this stuff to stick. So if we went back to those eight aspects of yoga that, that they gave us, we could say, well, one of the aspects of it is about kindness. You've heard some people talk about compassion, about how that's a good thing for us to do, and there's some evidence that says, in terms of getting better in the face of pain, finding a way to be compassionate for yourself is good, because often we beat ourselves up, right? When we have pain, we're not, it's not working. We beat ourselves up because it's not. Um, we talked about, or Eric mentioned acceptance, right? Well, in yoga, there's a word about contentment, which is very, very similar. This idea of finding a way to be okay, answering the question, am I okay now? Can I find a way to be okay now? This is a key aspect that you can practice in yoga. We can switch the pranayama aspect of yoga if you're more comfortable with it and say this is about breathing exercises or breathing practices. And we've got some, this is an interesting one um, that Lorimer and I have actually talked about a bunch of times because there's no evidence, absolutely zero evidence that providing a person with a breathing practice will create a different trajectory of recovery if you have chronic pain. You guys all clear on that? There is no outcome evidence that says if you take people with chronic pain and you give them a breathing practice, it will change how well they get better. We've got some evidence that says that when you do breathing practice, it changes your fight-flight system and your descending serotonergic, serotonergic inhibitory pain pathways and all these different things, but we don't have the outcome evidence that supports it. Right? Most of the research has been done on, in this area, it's been done on acute pain. There's not a lot of evidence around, around breathing practices and how it changes us in the face of chronic pain yet. There's a lot to be done around this, right? Um, there's, if we look at, at yoga, you can do work on interoception. Interoception, think of it as the physiological state of your being. And a lot of times with pain, we get disconnected from this. Right? Have you noticed that your patients often can't feel when their body's really tense? Not only they may not actually be able to feel their body, but they may not be able to feel muscle tension in their body. Right? You probably have noticed that a lot of your patients don't know that they're not breathing in a calm manner. Right? You may meet your patients who can't feel when their, even their proprioceptive capacity is limited. Right? So this is, this is another aspect of yoga that we could think of makes sense around the lived experience of pain. We know that um, attending the subtle sensations, so being able to concentrate on the subtle sensations of your body is important. That often people with pain would say, I can't feel the subtle sensations of my body anymore. I can only feel the pain there. Right, that place where the pain is, I take my mind there and I feel the pain, but I actually don't, can't feel the other sensations of my body. 
Um, and I know this is a case report kind of thing, but one of my patients really recently, she has really horrible uh, pain in her leg, a, a neuropathic pain down her leg that's sort of consuming the whole of her leg. It's not just a line anymore. It seems to be the whole thing. And she said, you know, we were going through this body awareness thing where I get people to go through their body and feel their physical body just with their mind. And she said, I went to this leg and all I can feel is the pain, but on this side I can feel my body. So what I started to do was I started to feel this leg that didn't feel much pain. And then I went over to this leg and I said, okay, I hear your pain. But then she started to look for, this is her words, I looked for those normal subtle sensations in this leg. And she said, and this is the part that I can't quite figure out. This is her saying this. I can't quite figure this out. When I went over there, it was so hard to feel them, and I started to look for them. And then I started to wonder, am I actually just visualizing it, recreating those sensations over here? Or am I actually finding those sensations over here? And then she did the really beautiful thing. She said, actually, you know what? I really don't care. Because when I do it, when I actually can start to feel this leg again, not just the pain, this leg, the pain's better for a while. And the more I do it, the better I get at it, the faster I can actually calm this pain down. So we got to research this stuff, right, to figure out what's going on. It's a fascinating consideration that pain seems to change body awareness. And it's possible that not being able to feel your body well actually keeps the pain going. But we don't know that for certain. I mean, that's the logical conclusion that you might run to. But of course, we've got to be careful, because that's got a whole lot of questions around it. Anyway, so um, yoga provides the opportunity to work on meditation, which we know is a really key thing for uh, pain reduction. There's a lot of evidence around that, a lot of evidence around the mindfulness education or mindfulness meditation. Although we do have to be careful because a, a lot of the evidence around mindfulness meditation is method methodologically not so great. Right? It's compelling, but it's not so great. Um, in, in Canada, the Canadian Pain Society, there's some very charismatic people in that that teach mindfulness. And um, I, I know the people quite well, and so I tease them about their mindless acceptance of mindfulness meditation as a panacea for all pain problems. <laughs> but this happens, right? Because charismatic people can really, really influence the way we do things. And I said, well, hang on a sec. Isn't pain a body, mind, spirit problem? So wouldn't it be better to actually not just work on the mind? And of course, the reaction is, well, in mindfulness training, there is, there is some movement. I'm like, yeah, there's some movement. But wouldn't it make sense to work on the mind and the body together, at least? I mean, that seems to make more sense for our existence to work on both, not just to work on one. So one of the other things, and this is just purely just something that I've seen, is that some people who have chronic pain, the thing that helps them to get better is to find a sense of peacefulness again. There's so much disruption, so much turmoil, and that the person to be able to move forward needs to get to that place of, I think Barrett, you're saying softness, right? That warmth and softness, that place of that sense of peacefulness. And I think that's you know, a lot of the, the hands-on things that we can do with people are to help them to get there, right? Someone mentioned this morning about our patients being trying to get into action and sometimes I think what we need to do is step back out of action for a bit, calm things down, and then we can act and move forward. Right? It's just, that's me thinking. I don't have a lot of science to back that up. Anyway, so just think about this for a sec. You've got this patient. Patient fell from three meters, sorry, uh, three yards, right? <laughs> Ten feet, right? So he falls, he lands on his pelvis, and, and he says, I landed on my tailbone, but of course he landed on his pelvis. And it's about two and a half uh, months ago, x-rays, and if you did palpation of it, his coccyx wasn't fractured, it's not displaced, medical examination is normal. Um, he tells you that the pain is right around his tailbone, points right there, and says it's actually spread now, right? Which, like a lot of chronic pains do, it's spread around, it's come to his anterior pelvis and to the, his right testicle as well. He says it's constant, it's getting worse when he moves around, and it's worse with weight bearing. And if he bears down at all, it actually makes it worse as well. And he's noticing the skin on his testicle is allodynic. So if he touches the skin on his testicle, it actually hurts. And actually, the more he touches it, the more it hurts. So it actually gets that ramp up. So um, he's also got this going on. He's angry because the medical people can't tell him what's wrong, right? Because they're saying, your x-ray looks fine. What's the problem, right? Um, and, of course, this is affecting his relationships a lot, right? This is affecting a lot of the aspects of his, his, his existence, as you would expect, with pain in this area. 
So we don't need to answer this, but what I would, you, you're, it could be, think of what are the manual techniques? I know I sort of put PT up there, but what could you do with this fellow in terms of putting your hands on him to help him get better? What might we do around yoga techniques? What might, might we do around this? I mean, I just get you to think about that for a sec. But also consider why would you do this stuff, right? So what's your goal? What would the goal be of putting your hands on this guy? What would your goal be if you were actually providing yoga technique? Right? It's a, a huge discussion to get into all this, but you consider is this is what we want to try to do. Why do we want to do this stuff? Right? I think a lot of times that we want to do this stuff is we want to do this. We want to provide the person with an experience that's inconsistent with the brain's interpretation of how dangerous this is or how threatening it is. Would that make some sense? For all of the other things that we can do, no matter what it is, the point is, can we get the person to experience something different than what their brain is concluding, right? And then we can go on to so many other aspects of this, but I think this is a key. So our goal is to try to decrease the threat value but we have other goals too. We've heard about self-efficacy, right? The ability to feel confident at your ability to change things. We want people to feel in control again, right? We've got to give this. This is really, really key, and it's part of what we do with neuroscience education. Um, so when we get people to move, you know, at the beginning I was talking about how we often don't tell people exactly how to do it. I wanted to share this. I wasn't going to, but because Corey's edge work and my stuff is so darn similar, I just had to say this. So what we off, this is the, the guidance that I often give people, is that if you're going to try to move in the face of pain, we want to get you to move to a spot where the pain just gets a wee tiny bit better. And you've got to decide for yourself. You have this conversation with your patient. Say, you know that spot where it gets a little bit better? Maybe you want to go there, or maybe you want to go just below it, right? You decide, because you may say, I don't want to go in there. Say, OK, we'll go below it for now. But some people say, it's okay. I feel OK nudging it. But when you get there, one of the terms that I've done is a shift on the, is this really dangerous, is, is this safe? To say to the person, when you are there, does this feel safe for your physical body? And then a whole bunch of my patients are saying, you know what? It's safe, but I'm going to pay for this later. Right? And I started thinking, well, if you think you're going to pay for it later, what's it going to do to your wound up cranky nervous system? So why don't we just start asking people, uh, will I pay for this later? Or you could shift it around. This is Simon's fault that I just trying to change this and didn't have the slide here. Is that maybe you want to ask, will I be OK later? Right? To flip it around. So you ask people to go up to the edge or wherever they feel good. You ask them, is this safe? Will I pay for it later? And they come up with, uh, I think I'm safe. I don't think I'll pay for it later. But while they're there, I would get you to consider to ask the person that while you're there, you need to pay attention to the pain, your breath, and your body tension. And I think this is really, really important for us to understand is that the way this is set up is in light of what we know about pain science. We know that pain is not an accurate indication of how much you should move. Is that right? right? Pain is not an accurate indication of tissue health or tissue damage. Therefore, it's not an accurate indication of how much you should move. So we need some other assistance. And I got thinking about this. Well, if you have rheumatoid arthritis and you're in a flare-up, what do I tell you about how much you sh when you should stop moving? I say, pay attention to the pain, the heat, the redness, and the swelling. Right? I give you four alarm systems to pay attention to because pain by itself is not accurate. So if you're going to move, let's say pain's still not accurate, let's get you to pay attention to multiple alarm systems and to consider that maybe if you can't breathe calmly, your system is saying to you, that's too much. Maybe if you can feel your body getting tight, your system is saying, that's too much. Maybe if you can't pay attention to the pain anymore, it's because the system is saying, that's too much. So why don't we get you to try to do this? But of course, one of the problems with this is that a lot of people in pain can't really feel their body all that well. A lot of people in pain really don't know how to breathe calmly in their best place yet. So sometimes this system doesn't work really well because the person is not able to feel their body well, is not able to control their breath well in the very best place. So sometimes we need to teach them how to do it over there, right? And then when the person can breathe calmly and be able to decrease body tension in a nice place, we can get them to try to do it while they're moving. Right? 
Now, bear in mind that part of the reason that I, I've got this model is because the people that I see, like a lot of the people who have been up here, are very, very complex. The pain's been there a super long time. And a lot of the system has been changed. So a lot of times you have to pay attention to a lot more of these things. Right? Does that sound like Corey's model too? It's pretty wild. Actually, when I was listening, to, as Barrett was talking yesterday, I was thinking, oh my god, it's for a lot of the, the words I use. Around breathing, often I get people to work on softness. And, and it's a, a key thing of what he's saying as well. So, a friend of mine says this is Neil's four-point interoceptive guide for moving with more ease. It's sort of too wordy, I think, but that's what he's suggesting, is that actually pay attention to more than just the pain. Pay attention to your pain, your breath, your body tension, um, and to your mind. The fourth part is your mind, right? Calm. If you say, I'm safe and I won't pay for it later, this is you uh, paying attention to calmness of your mind. So I just wanted to show you one other picture here. I don't know if you've seen this one. We just got off the internet. You know how your brain tries to come up with a sensible story? We always have to remember this, and often this pic certain picture often gets us to actually feel our brain trying to come up with a sensible story about what's really going on. And we need to keep on reminding ourselves that that's what pain is, right? Pain is your brain. Not only is it about threat, but it's your brain trying to come up with a sensible story. And we're trying to provide, as a number of people have said, a different story. A story of more ease, a story of less threats. And we can do it through teaching people with words, and we can do it with teaching people through movement. Because a lot of the patients that we work with are kinesthetic, right? They're kinesthetic learners. And so sometimes you don't need to start with pain neuroscience education like this. You can start by providing the person education through movement first, and then use the response of the movement to reinforce the education, right? So hey, you just move more ease, that's pretty cool, right? And then you can actually go into the pain neuroscience education afterwards and they'll be more open to it. It's often the experience that you might have to sort of switch around which way you go. So I see I'm out of time. So I'm just going to pass this. This is a model about getting better. You can see it on my website. There's actually like 11 page description of how this works. Uh, this is just another model of considering pain in a different way, which is also on my website if you want to see it. And that's just my website there. And I have time for questions. So as before, we have some time for questions. And again, we have a microphone that will be coming around the room. So if you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high so I can try not to miss you. We have one at the back of the room right here. And who else is, would like to would have a question? Please pop up your hand. OK, I've got another person over here by the, by the pillar. OK, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Dina Shalom. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, any thoughts, or do you have any thoughts about working with this one-on-one -on -one versus in a group class? Oh, actually, I think, I think that a lot of the people that, that when you're getting them to start into yoga, it would be a lot better, or actually any movement practice, to start one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, because we really have to see how the person responds when we get the person to move. And a lot of guidance is often really necessary. Um, most of the people who um, come into a yoga class who've never had any sort of one-on-one, -on -one, they, they often don't succeed as well. Because right? you know, how you're going to breathe, how you're going to move in a certain way is, is so unique. So I, I teach therapeutic yoga classes. When people come in, I usually see them one, two, or three times on one-on-one, -on -one, and then they, they seem to succeed. This is seem, right? This is not research. This is they seem to succeed so much better when you do that. Because really, you've got to get people to stop competing with the other people in the room, stop competing with what they used to be able to do. And of course, the other competition that we always do is we compete with what we think the teacher thinks we should be able to do. Which is sort of weird, but we, we predict what the teacher might think, and then we compete with that. So we've got to try to get a lot of that stuff out of the way for people to succeed with this, usually. Right? And of course, a lot of people think that yoga is about standing on your head, so it's really nice to show them that there's this gentle aspect of yoga that you can use to try to work in all this other work. Yeah. OK, we have another question up here. She's got her hand. And we've got another one back here. OK. And Hi, I'm Jenna Rubin. And, um, I'm an applied movement science major at uh, San Diego State. And I just noticed that a lot of yoga practices, they incorporate music into the program. 
And I was wondering how you feel about music in terms of <laughs> pain reception or in yoga in general. Right. Or research on okay. that. Uh, it's not so much research. Well, we've got research that says that music can be really calming for your physiology, and that could be good. My belief is that what we're trying to do is get people to change their nervous system. And sometimes music actually gets you to focus externally and not take your awareness inside. And so what I would do if you were asking me as an individual who's coming to my class, I would say, when you listen to music, does it allow you to pay attention to yourself and body better? And if you said yes, I'd say, well, okay, well, let's, let's have you listen to some music. Because I want you to be able to pay attention to the stuff you're trying to change. If you said to me, music takes me outside and I get totally in the music and I'm really not paying attention to my inter interoceptive stuff, I'd say it's, listen to music sometimes, but when you're trying to change your nervous system, you need to be focused on trying to feel your body and change it. That would be my view. Yeah. Next question right here in the back, and then we do let this gentleman up front. Hi, Neil. Um, I'm Susie. Um, I wanted to ask you how you felt about weekend certification courses <laughs> for different things like yoga and Pilates, and what your background is in yoga. Oh, OK. Um, I've been practicing meditation for a long, long time. And I actually came to yoga um, because my meditation teacher said, you know, you're so stiff, you'll never be able to sit still long enough to be able to actually meditate if you want to do, so you should go to yoga. Um, and so that's where I came into my yoga practice from, from that aspect. Um, I mean, I, I've trained with so many different people that that probably is less relevant in terms of the yoga bit. But in terms of, um, well, now I've forgotten the first part of the question that you said. Weekend certification. Weekend certifications. I think you know the answer to that. Um, I mean, I, I, I think if you want to teach people how to move, uh, you can you might be able to do it with a weekend thing, but I think it doesn't really help you keep people safe. And if we're talking about therapeutic yoga, I think you need to know so much more than that. Yeah, I, just to elaborate on that, I just did wanted to, um, to be clear that uh, it's just because we're physical therapists doesn't mean that we should be inclined to teach a movement technique that we may not be fully mm. certified in, or how do you feel about that statement? Yeah, well, I think that if you want to use the aspects of some aspects of yoga as a physical therapist, go right ahead. If you want to be a yoga teacher, go get trained as a yoga teacher. It'd be the same as Pilates. One other thing I'd mention about that is sometimes when I teach healthcare people and I teach them like a two or three day course and really get into this, one of my big messages at the end of it is, do not walk out of here thinking you understand this. This is a highly, highly complex thing, and my job is to try to make it more easy to understand, but this is the beginning. You, you can't walk out of here and think you understand pain and everybody who's got it, right? But there's this arrogance that often happens in any of these trainings when you take this small bit, because as teachers, our job is to make it more easily understandable. But often we miss the complexity of it around it, and you only get that once you've been in it for a long, long, long time. And I would say if you're going to teach meditation or if you're going to teach yoga, you need to practice it yourself. If you don't have your own personal practice, it's really hard to do it. Although you have to make sure you're not egocentric about that, right? Because whatever works for you doesn't necessarily work for me, right? Yeah. That leads right into my question, which, which I, got, I got into somatic work through yoga initially, um, and I'm not doing it at the moment. But um, there are widely varying standards for yoga teacher certification, like in California, 200-hour minimum. Um, and if someone is presenting with a clinical pain problem, you know, seeing a clinician, you don't necessarily just want to refer them to any yoga class. So I'm wondering, yeah. would you start them out with someone who is a clinician and a yoga teacher, which may be a rare combination, mm -hmm. or do you have like a short list of yoga teachers that you trust and would send them off to? Well, you, could, you can go and look at um, uh, the International Association of Yoga Therapists to try to find more people. There's actually a group, uh, a Facebook page group that's all rehab professionals who are also yoga teachers. It's called Bridge Builders. That's Matt Taylor, the guy at the back, that sort of created all that. He's got his arms crossed, looking angry right now. Um, but uh, there, aren't, there aren't a whole lot of places where you can go for this. And it's actually one of the things that I think that we need to consider is if you're going to ask someone to go do yoga, get to know a yoga teacher and start to have a team with them, right? If you're a yoga, you know, the, the programs that I teach integrate healthcare people with yoga teachers because we need both. If you're going to do the two together, then do the two together. Right? I think that's where you're getting at is so key, is you need that, right? 
Um, yeah. Next question. Arms nice and high. Going, going, going. Okay. So oh, I, there's one. Oh, oh sorry. I, I, I did. Um, hi, I'm Bill Rubine. So I'm, I work with the Yoga of Awareness program. We talked about that. Yeah. I think, so they're, they're basically working with fibro patients mainly. Right. And I, I think that their approach to fibro patients is to release negative emotions and relax. What she talks about all the time is relaxation in the context of movement. Yes. That's like her phrase. So I've seen patients get better there where they, they, they don't push too hard. They kind of calm everything down and then they start to get some relief and then they start to move on from there. Yes. But honestly, I think I've seen more fibro patients get better from just kind of uh, sucking it up and just like, I'm going to have pain if I exercise, I'm going to have pain if I don't, and they just get on with it, just in my own experience. Mm. So I was wondering what your experience is with that. <laughs> people are different. Some, some people uh, gravitate to the more aggressive movement practices. Maybe I can give you this. this in Toronto, there's a big yoga conference. And I was teaching that a few years ago about pain stuff, and they interviewed me on the radio. And uh, I was a little naive. I hadn't done a lot of radio interviews. And the per person asked me, if someone had a chronic pain condition, what sort of yoga would you suggest they don't go to? Which it was really dumb that I answered the question. But part of the answer I said was, you know, when people have really wound up cranky nervous system, when they're really feeling highly sensitized, probably the more aggressive, you know, uh, active, acrobatic, gymnastic yogas, and the, here's where the mistake I made was, like Bikrams or Ashtanga, uh, might not be the best thing to do. And I actually got um, phone calls the next day from people with fibromyalgia, specifically a, a, two different women with fibromyalgia contacted me the next day to say, stop saying that. The, ones, the one said, I tried all the Mambi Pambi restorative lay there meditate yoga. And it didn't work, Ashtanga worked, right? And so she was actually quite upset with me. Of course, I wanted to ask her, well, do you think the Ashtanga worked because you had done all this other stuff beforehand, right? Because <laughs> it's possible, but we don't know. So, but I would really say is that I don't know. We don't have the evidence around this. And some people seem to do better with, with uh, something more energetic for a lot of reasons that we don't understand, right? The whole push through pain to get better thing, I. I it's not where I would say people would go, but some people go there and get better, and it just leaves us all going, I don't understand that. It's, but the point is, it's complex, right? You know, pain is so multifaceted, how could you figure it out just because you're saying this particular mechanical stimulation should make you worse? But that is Rene Descartes' idea. It's not our idea of pain, right? Another question back here. Yep. Gentlemen. This question comes to you all the way from Brazil. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rafael. Uh, uh, I, I, I was trying to to read some some things that was presented uh, this weekend, and I, I myself as a therapist, I'm a physical therapist. I used like manual techniques to try to calm the body right. of my patient, and like Corey uh, did. And you said in, your, in the beginning of your presentation, I used some similar techniques to 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 show that the pain edge uh, could be moving, right? And this will uh, make uh, his body feel better. Do you believe that with meditation you can calm down the mind of the person and use this as a part of the treatment? Because I uh, I've been through uh, meditation myself for mm -hmm. uh, some years. Yeah. And I practice uh, not not yoga but kung fu, and it's, mm -hmm. it's in some aspect it's very similar. Yeah. And I try to make my patients understand that, or not understand what I'm trying to say, but what his his mind is yeah. not uh, is not permitting him to do anymore. You know, so let's calm down. And how how do you use do you use this? Absolutely. Okay. There's there's I think there's a lot of people as they start to try to move. There's so much for better, lack of a better word, wind up, there's so much sensitization or so much tension that when the person starts to move, they, they don't seem to be able to succeed. So I actually use a lot of biofeedback. 
So it'll actually get people to do breathing practice or meditation or relaxation, whatever it is, while a person can actually see on a screen how they're doing. And one of the really interesting things I've noticed is that is just with breathing techniques is sometimes you get a person to breathe calmly and you, they say it feels calm. And I'll say, tell me when you start to really feel calm. And a lot of times when people say, oh, I'm really feeling calm now, the biofeedback stuff hasn't changed at all yet. Right? And so they need to do it longer before they, you can actually measure changes in skin conductance or heart rate variability or muscle or EMG muscle tension, all those things. So it's, it's interesting. Is, so the answer is yes, these things are important, I think, for a lot of people. Not everybody, but a lot. But also to consider is that a lot of times we need to do them longer than you would normally expect to really get the good measurable physiological changes. And that's purely a clinical observation. I can't tell you any research that has actually looked at that at all. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So he was saying that our, our culture wants it now, and we need to treat these things as the physical change of, of, that we're trying to get through any of these techniques, right? We need to recognize you're trying to change the nervous system, and typically the nervous system needs time to practice. And so if you give people a, a technique and, and they come back a week later and they say it didn't work, well, the very first thing you need to ask is how long were you able to do it, right? Because maybe they actually weren't able to do it long enough, there wasn't enough dose to actually change the nervous system in, in, in a productive way, which would be our guess, right? Yeah. That brings us to the end of our question and answer time. So, Neil Pearson, thank you very much.